Hi everyone, yeah, so I'm Matt Horton. Uh, I'm an engineer at CDL. Um, if you've not heard of us, CDL's a uh, top 100 tech firm listed in the Financial Times Future 100. Um, basically, we build and run software that processes um, transactions um, for high volume retail um, customers, um, such as Tesco, Bank and Swinton. If you've ever bought insurance in the UK, it's highly likely that your information will have been processed by uh, the solutions that myself and my colleagues build at our campus in Stockport. So this is a, a talk on a bit of a, a journey for me that started uh, how I got into using uh, AWS. This goes back to kind of Christmas, um, sort of 2015. And we were presented as a, as a team with a, a problem to solve. And this is fraud in insurance. And there's kind of a lot of um, kind of big numbers on the screen there. But basically, um, fraud costs everybody in this room about £50 a year on top of their premiums. So if we can stop fraud or reduce it, then we can save everybody in this room some money. So we, uh, as a software house, have been going quite a long time, and we had two data centers in Stockport, and we looked at kind of building a solution around kind of physical appliance, so rack-based solutions that deliver this kind of raw um, sort of um, power to process data. So we had um, a couple of IBM Natezas, for example, and these things, you know, they're generally quite good. Um, they do what they say on the tin, but you tend to, when you start a project with these, you've got this kind of massive capital expenditure. Plus, if you're successful, you tend to fill these things up pretty quickly. And then you can't really scale unless you ring a man from IBM and he comes in a van, wheels the old one out, plums the new one in. So this was kind of slowing you know, the project down and it just wasn't scalable for us. So this is where we turned to, to using the cloud and I got involved with AWS. And as well as that, we took the decision to use um, kind of what I would call more open software. So this is stuff that's not necessarily open source, but stuff that's flexible in term terms of the licensing. So um, the software vendor isn't telling you you can only run it on this particular piece of hardware with this number of CPUs, etc. cetera, because um, that was a problem for us in the past. So we built out uh, an example, a kind of proof of concept running in AWS sort of fairly quickly. Um, this demo is simulating a customer buying insurance. The data supplied by the customers um, kind of submitted um, uh, to a, a search engine, essentially. And we're, what we're doing here is we're searching about 21 million previous insurance quotes, um, about 148 million MOT documents. And we can see the different quotes that this particular consumer is doing in pretty much real time and the, the factors that he's changing in between the different uh, journeys that he's, uh, he's interacting us, uh, with. Um, so we can do things like, you know, has he changed the amount of no claims discount years he's claimed to have? You know, uh, here we can see um, he's using different forenames. So we do synonym matching. So Robert, Bob, Bobby, etc. It's changing where he's kind of keeping his vehicle, lots of different things and um, that would affect the price of the, the product we'd ultimately offer. So kind of at this point, we were fairly satisfied that we could build something quickly in AWS and it wasn't going to cost us a lot of money in terms of kind of capital expenditure. So we had this proof of concept that you saw there that we showed to different customers. And it kind of surprised us a bit because we'd been tasked with solving fraud, but what we started to get asked a lot was, about other problems that we could help our customers with. So we take the insurance sector as an example again. Around 86% of people shop around for their car insurance. About 70% of people say that the application um, process for insurance would be improved if the number of questions asked were to be reduced or ideally eliminated altogether. And around 82% of insurance execs believe that personalized experiences are going to be important to retain market share of millennials. Does anybody here actually like buying insurance? Okay, there's always, there's always one. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, generally, you get, you, get, you, get that, you get that response. And I've asked that question in a room full of insurers and insurance brokers, and they don't put their hands up either. Um, you can, I think it's fair to say that insurance is definitely a bit of a grudge purchase. You have to drive it if you, if you want to drive a car. And it goes a bit further than that. 
what we see inside CDL and what our customers see is that it's also a single touch point um, once a year between the insurance broker or the insurer and the, the consumer. Um, and that tends to be at renewal time. Um, you can get additional touch points, but again, they don't tend to be positive ones. So if you just cr crashed your car, that's not probably going to be a good interaction with, uh, with that customer. So what we started looking at was using the power of data and the ability of, of the cloud to scale was to kind of improve the interactions that um, customers have and by building our software around three themes. Because by ingesting and harnessing data in real time, we're able to get the best indicators of who consumers are and then we can personalize and make the best decisions to deliver products in a simple and engaging way. So here's an example of doing just that, creating additional positive interactions with a customer by allowing them to buy and manage a portfolio of products and services. Specifically, Paul here is looking to buy a new car. And by providing insight, we can help Paul make the best decision. Behind the scenes, we're using data we have for over 74 million vehicles and over a billion MOT tests. We can provide a valuation for the vehicle. We can reveal how many previous owners it's had and if it's got any outstanding finance on it. Going a step further, what we can do is scan those billion MOT test records in real time and show that for that particular make, model, and vintage of Land Rover, around 26% of them will fail their MOT in the first five years. And we also know the top reasons why they're going to fail their MOT, again, based on the particular make and model and vintage. So Paul here, if he was buying that Land Rover, he might want to check out the um, windscreen uh, wipers or the front position lamps. If the car was over five years, the reasons change, so again, front lamps or the offside uh, service brake uh, wearing excessively. And finally, we can tell you what the kind of most popular color for the car is as well. So it's gray in this case. So the data in that example is searched in real time using um, a product we've developed called Hummingbird and it's based around microservices. Essentially, it's a context engine that you can call via an API. Right now in production, we're processing around 9 million requests a day as part of varied uh, customer journeys. And our DevOps team are delivering uh, new functionality to production in two week sprints. Um, as I said, we, we started out building this for fraud, but we've um, taken it into different use cases. So fraud and quote manipulation to right through to kind of ensuring that loyal customers are rewarded with discount. And we've achieved seven nines of availability in the last three years that we've been running it in production. So I'll walk you through kind of how the system works. So this is a logical architecture view of the, the solution. So typically what we'd see is an API call made when a kind of data enrichment is required. So kind of down here, you'd have kind of some sort of customer management system that says, I need some more intelligence on this customer so I can treat them in a better way, process them using uh, the most optimal journey. So they make an API call into the microservices um, basically, what happens then is we go off and we search for everything we know about that customer. So we have a couple of elastic um, clusters running. The first one is uh, what we call a shared intelligence cluster. So this is data that CDL um, either generates itself or has license to hold that we're able to provide to uh, customers. The second cluster is where uh, we see um, our customers providing their own data, um, so combine it with the shared data and their own kind of secret source, if you like. So what we see is them um, um, share data for a variety of sources. Um, a lot of the time we're doing change data capture from kind of relational databases into Elastic uh, and using the, the, the data sets in parallel. So the searches happen in parallel, and um, once we have that data, it gets passed to a, a kind of rules engine which apply, applies kind of customer business specific rules and then that generates a data enrichment which is passed back to the kind of customer management system that made the API call originally and then that application is able to make a better decision with that new insight on how to in interact better with that particular consumer. Okay, So when we started um, building this we were pretty new to the cloud um, we 
hadn't done much in the way of DevOps, um, but we had a kind of blank sheet of paper to, to go about running the team as, as we saw fit. And rather than kind of dictate a set of rules on particular kind of technologies or methods of working, what we set were some kind of design principles for the team. Um, so kind of for elasticity, we're all here to talk about AWS, so it's no surprise we use AWS for infrastructure as a service. And I mentioned already we're using Elasticsearch as that kind of distributed search um, capability. Um, Terraform, we use a lot to define infrastructure as code, so we can ensure basic consistency for automated deployments. Um, because um, we were new to um, the cloud, this was seen as a, a somewhat risky project because it was just simply different from what we did um, uh, in normal software projects. So we wanted to kind of mitigate the risk um, as much as possible. So you do that through automation, basically, and having absolutely everything in configuration management. One of the first things we actually built um, when we were um, running with it in project with this, this solution was a performance test rig. Uh, and still to this day, we run that performance test rig after each two-week sprint. So at the end of the sprint, kind of a, a Terraform apply happens, a development environment gets stood up, it's loaded full of uh, kind of test data, and we fire through 25 million requests through the system. So we can know that kind of every line of code that we've changed in the last two weeks isn't affecting performance. And we visualize that using Kibana. Um, we've got the option to kind of scale horizontally or vertically. And the Elasticsearch clusters and all the microservices, we're running those across multiple availability zones uh, in AWS. To achieve uh, zero downtime, we, when we push out new releases, we're also using blue-green deployments. So we set those kind of design principles for the team, um, which is a, a kind of good method, we think. It's worked out quite well, because um, they have some freedom as long as they kind of stick to those principles. But again, as it was, uh, some of this was new to us, we looked to um, work with partners. So these were relationships that we had to build because we hadn't uh, done anything in the cloud before. And um, I mentioned two of them here. Elastic were really, really helpful to us. Um, and also AWS have been fantastic um, sort of technology partners to have as well. So this gave us um, confidence, particularly through the AWS well-architected um, framework, that what we had designed was actually um, following kind of best practice. And um, it also gave us some kind of features to perhaps um, work on in, in future sprints, because we can always improve. Um, so when I started out with the AWS Well Architected Review, um, it was all done on like PDFs. Uh, it's got better, the tool's actually built into the, um, the console now, so if you just search Well Architected Tool, it comes up and you get basically, uh, you get to define your workload, you answer a series of questions, if you're unsure about it, um, kind of videos on the right-hand side tell you um, kind of what the questions mean and how you can fill them in. The other thing is that you can um, get all this done through a, a partner, and I think uh, definitely Steamhouse, because they're fairly local to where I am in Manchester, do, do this. Uh, and I think PA as well, and they're, they're here today, so if you're interested in having a partner do it, go and talk to them. Um, what we had was actually our account architect from the AWS side came in and did this for us uh, in the first instance, and now we, we do them ourselves. So that's another way you can, you can do this. And like I say, they're really good um, um, because they highlight things that you can improve on going forward, and you can plan those into your sprints. The other thing I thought I'd mention as well is if you've kind of built a kind of cool piece of software, um, one of the things um, that you might struggle to do is kind of reach an, an audience with that. And again, AWS are really good at helping people out. So through their partner network, we've just got on the beta for this private link um, ready um, uh, partner beta program. So if you've got some software, um, what this allows you to do is connect with other AWS customers um, and use essentially private link um, simple connectivity to connect up to your software and services so you're kind of running over the kind of secure AWS backbone and you're not having the difficulty of, of um, uh, what often is quite complex connectivity requirements in order to um, work with a, with a new customer. So that's another one to look into if you're, if you're in that kind of business. 
and um, there's some requirements to it. Uh, I'll skip over these, but basically you've got to you've got to have the well-architected framework review done. You've also got to submit some architecture docs to have those reviewed, and you've got to um, basically help out with some of the marketing as well. So things like um, the blogs and helping with content for the microsite. But then AWS is essentially a, a kind of sales and marketing as well as a as a technical partner to you as well. Okay, so overall, this is what the, the tech stack looks like. So um, we'll dig into some of the AWS components we use. Uh, I mentioned Elastic already. Um, infrastructure as code, I've mentioned Terraform. We use Packer to bake the, uh, the AMIs. Um, all the microservices are written in Java, um, but our Java developers are accelerated using frameworks from Spring, specifically Spring Boot and Spring Integration. They're running Java 11 at the moment, which um, has really helped them out because they can use some of the reactive things, so things like non-blocking um, components and um, basically um, uh, implementing things like back off and, and stuff into the, into the code base to um, have um, a really robust and really um, uh, code set for time critical journeys, which I'll kind of come on to the, the time um, scenario of our, of our stack in a minute. Um, the microservices don't talk to each other directly, so um, we put a message on a queue, and right now we're using ActiveMQ Artemis in network-based replication mode. Um, one of the things that we've done through Well Architect Review and the Elastic consultancy we've had is identified that we're going to move to Kafka, and um, one of the things that AWS had done to help us there is I kind of spent two weeks building a Kafka cluster and testing the stack with that, and then at the last reInvent, they announced um, a managed stream of Kafka, or MSK, so Kafka as a service, so I can basically reduce my two weeks of effort in into, into a couple of API calls, but that's what AWS do, um, so that's, that's really cool. Um, so we're, gonna, we're in the process of moving to MSK at the moment. Um, a lot of the actual functionality, we took the decision to drive it through config rather than the hard coding a lot of things. We used to use console from HashiCorp, but we switched to using AWS parameter store just because it was kind of like one less thing for us to stand up and manage, so that's always a good thing. And the developers could focus on the functionality rather than kind of background IT services. The rules engines in something called Drools and we do all the usual things that you'd expect through a kind of automated stack, so uh, CICD through Jenkins. And for kind of on-call engineers, we've integrated the Elastic stack into our monitoring system and we're posting out to MS Teams, so uh, basically it's Microsoft version of Slack. You know that better, which most people do. So I'm not gonna go through, through every box on this diagram, but this is the physical um, architecture. So I'll just point out some of the things that we're doing in AWS. So um, one of the things was uh, speed of response is absolutely critical. So if you imagine you're on a price comparison site, into your details, hit go, prices come back on screen. About half the prices you see on screen will have come through CDL in most cases. And um, a lot of that is through on-premises data centers. So as the project got more successful, we needed Direct Connect to uh, guarantee that, that, that kind of uh, resilient network connectivity. Um, there's timeouts within the, um, the, the journey, so we get about, um, at CDL, we get about six seconds to process the entire customer journey, of which this system is just one small part of. So this system actually only gets two seconds to return a response. So all the kind of stuff that I mentioned in Java um, and the um, ability to kind of retry and things like that is really, really important. Um, I mentioned earlier on that customers tip their um, data into here and we need to load it into Elastic. So what we do is we give them an S3 bucket and that fires an S3 event, triggers a Lambda function and that um, basically runs Logstash in ECS uh, we tried Fargate, but there's a four gig limit on the storage at the moment, and some of our input data is, is over four gigs, so kind of hashtag AWS wish list if anybody's listening. Uh, increase that for us, please. That'd be most helpful. Um, yeah, the other thing that we've done is kind of got auto-scaling around all of this. One of the more recent 
things we've done is actually put a uh, auto scaling group around each data node in the Elasticsearch cluster, and that's linked via a lifecycle hook. Um, so that if that particular node dies, we can detach, essentially detach the storage and then reattach it to the node that's brought back into service through the auto scaling. Um, and that basically just speeds up the kind of recovery of the Elasticsearch cluster. Um, yeah, I think that's about right. You'll see some other stuff as we, as we go through. Um, the layer at the top that's kind of running Logstash, um, we benefit from a kind of CDL wide now kind of cloud platform team and what they do is provision compute for lots of different squads to share so rather than us running our own clusters we kind of have one pool across CDL and we can make use of that so they can um, essentially save the company money by um, estimating how much compute we need and, and doing kind of a mixture of uh, reserved instance and spot so that's a really good way of doing that and then as a squad we can just call upon that compute power when needed okay so the kind of ability to analyze data, that's been a real critical part of building out our software. And using the same Elastic Stack technology that we've implemented into that kind of customer journey, we're also able to visualize insights of system performance in real time. So these are examples of kind of some of our monitoring, uh, real-time monitoring dashboards. This is using a technology from Elastic called Canvas. Basically, I'd describe it as a PowerPoint that keeps itself up to date in real time. Um, so this is Hummingbird, um, I can't remember when I took, this is a video, but um, it runs like this and it updates itself in real time back at our campus. Um, so basically here what you have is the number of requests coming in today, so there's about 1.6 million in at the time this video was taken. That generates about 8.4 million search requests and each search request can generate multiple search results, so that expands out to 125 million search results. As well as that, what we're doing is we're combining those requests and the search results back into um, new documents that we're then storing again in roughly real time back into the cluster, so it's available that essentially within one second the next time that customer might choose to interact with us. So, so far, we've, we've ingested 25 million new documents. So I kind of mentioned about the two-second rule um, up at the top. That's the average response time. So it's 174 milliseconds to do that kind of enrichment journey. Um, we do have some data that we're not allowed to hold in Elastic, for kind of legal and compliance reasons, things like credit reference. So we do have to make external calls out to other services. So of that 174 milliseconds, 141 milliseconds of it is, the ex is, is an external call out. So kind of at the bottom there is the kind of really low number of how quick this thing is. Okay. So we also wanted to kind of present the information in a business friendly way um, uh, in real time as well. So this is another example of ca uh, use of Canvas that we've done. So people processing multiple quotes and changing their details in between is a, in order to get a lower price is a, is a problem for the insurance industry. So this is um, an implementation of our software Hummingbird where um, traditionally, people who are competitors with each other have pulled certain amounts of data in order to combat fraud, basically. So this is an example, I think I took this on Sunday, um, there's about 183,000 requests gone through the, the system so far. Of those 183,000, um, 34,000 people have changed their occupation one or more times, 42,000 changed the amount of mileage they claim to do each year. 14,000 changed um, um, where they actually keep their vehicle. Um, about 2,500 have changed the amount of claims that they've had in previously where it was their fault. Um, 477 people have changed their name, so that's an interesting one. That's called fronting, so if I had a 17-year-old son, um, is it cheaper for, to insure the car in my name or his name? You can probably guess which. Um, but is he, is he the main driver or am I? And we also know that people have a lot of time on their hands. So of the 183,000 requests uh, uh, we had in, about 202 people did more than 50 quotes. And we can dig into this a bit further. So this is one case that the system's highlighted. Um, so this is um, the difference of where people uh, kind of keep their car and where they live. So this is um, 
just on Google Maps, where somebody lives. Okay, so this is Birmingham, but they keep their car somewhere else. So this is uh, Inverness, so quite different. If you're interested in commuting, it's about seven hours, 20 minutes. Uh, interestingly, that person also does 3,000 miles a year. So, yeah. um, so it's quite a funny one to show. Um, there is a more serious side to it, uh, which I always have to explain. Um, so this is really useful insight for, for our customers, obviously. Um, what doesn't happen is that they just make a decision based on this because they're actually perfectly valid use cases where that scenario is okay. So um, I did a shorter version of this talk um, at Manchester Metropolitan University and I went to a coding school in Manchester as well. Students, that's perfectly valid. So often they leave their car at their parents' house, go to a big city to study where basically it would be a bad idea to drive around. You know, so they use public transport, they use a tube if they're studying in London. So what this generates is not an automated decision, but it helps um, the kind of our customers in their contact centre environments target what calls they're going to make and make the most efficient use of the kind of call centre operator's time. So yeah, the robots haven't taken over insurance just yet. Okay, so reliability. Our software and services are absolutely mission critical to our clients. Many of them operate major high street brands and they've got reputations to uphold. So their customer, the consumer, they also have really high expectations of being able to access um, services when they want them, day or night, and those services just need to be available and responsive. Um, AWS doesn't do us any favors in this regard because those kind of cloud platforms, they've set a real expectation that those kind of software and services they're always on, even during updates. And the consumers now basically just expect this from their bank, from Netflix, Facebook, doesn't matter. It has to be on regardless of what's happening behind the scenes. So we kind of talked before about these kind of design principles we had, you know, the architecture design, the well-architected review frameworks, the consultancy that we brought in to kind of ensure that we were doing the right things. But we want to go a step further and kind of apply kind of chaos engineering. Uh, we're not quite as advanced as Netflix, um, so we're doing this um, at the kind of end of the sprints in development environments in that performance test environment I talked about. But basically, we want to build our confidence that the system could withstand kind of turbulent conditions in production. And one of the ways we do that is, is kind of applying chaos engineering, but through the well-architected review uh, framework, and they call it game days. Uh, and this allows you to basically test how your architecture and processes perform, kind of simulate events in a production-like environment. If you're brave, you can do it in production. Um, understand where improvements can be made. Kind of um, pr practice responses in a supported environment kind of through failure injection. And the other thing that was really useful for me um, uh, was kind of at the opportunity not to focus on some of the technical things actually by doing these game days, we actually developed organizational experience in dealing with events. So I've been an on-call engineer most of my career. There's nothing more daunting than going live with a new system and then, you know, two o'clock in the morning, you get woken up by an alert and you've never seen this problem before and it's you that's got to kind of restore service. So by having these kind of failures and unexpected things happening in a safe environment, the engineers can build up that confidence that when it happens to them in production, because um, failures will always happen, that they can deal with it, or the system is architected in a way that it's able to cope. So this is an example of kind of a day, game day that we ran on the Hummingbird system. Um, so the DevOps team that run thing, they were unaware that this was actually taking place, which is another quite good tip, I guess. Um, basically, that ensured that they react just like they would on any other day. They didn't put any additional monitoring in place. They didn't make sure everybody was in the office instead of working from home. They didn't watch the big monitoring screens more than they normally would. And basically, what we've got here is a very simplified architecture of, of the system. We've got some EC2 instances, and they're running some microservices. 
and I didn't particularly care which, so they could be running some of the Java code, they might be running some Elastic stuff, they might be running Rules Engine. And what we did was we just went in and very simply started to terminate some of those instances. Um, and if you've used kind of auto-scaling before, you might be able to guess what happened next. Um, the auto-scaling group detected an abnormality because we'd said we must have six servers to run this load, we start killing them off. Other ones get brought back into uh, start launching, and a few seconds later, they're brought back into service, and essentially the system's self-healing here because the messages are on the, on the queue. They've tried to hit a terminated instance, it's still left on the queue. The next time round, it gets picked up. Might take slightly longer than it, it would have done previously, but essentially, um, you know, no, no problems here. So during that, we kind of measure what's, what's normal and see if there's any abnormalities. So this was during the game day. It's a kind of 15-minute snapshot. These are the two, um, this one and this one, the two critical numbers. So number of errors, zero and the average response time was 163 milliseconds. So remember, I've got that two-second slot that I have to hit. So that's all good. So you can probably tell that we've got a lot of logging and metrics built into the system. That's, that's a really good thing to have. Um, and last time I checked, we have a kind of about six billion metrics, log lines, et cetera, available to us. But if I'm an engineer and my system's malfunctioning, which one of those six billion things is going to tell me where my problem is. There's no way we can, we can analyze all of that information ourselves, even with tools as powerful as kind of Kibana. So we turn to machine learning to help us with that, to catch what we might miss. So this, again, is built into Elastic. It's anomaly detection, basically. Um, so you kind of got the swim lanes at the top, with red being a kind of universal sign of danger in system monitoring world. Um, wait for the video to catch up. Yeah, so you can probably just about see here, there's a couple of red dots uh, on the screen. It goes back to the 1st of April 2019, and there's a severity here. And what this line is telling us is that the typical response time uh, was 158 mil, uh, uh, milliseconds, and at the moment, it's three times higher than that. So there's something not quite right with what's going on. So by clicking on that anomaly, and we can dig into the, um, the metrics a bit more. So it takes it to that kind of period of time. And um, basically, this figure down the middle here is the number of seconds taken through each of the microservices. So we've got about six of them. So you can kind of see there's some four seconds, four seconds, and then these other ones are less. So already we're, we're kind of getting to narrowing down from those six billion things into kind of which microservice is actually causing the problem. So you can see the spikes on the graphs as well. So if we dig into those in a bit more detail, um, we're getting closer each time. So again here, you can kind of see, well, this thing here, probably not the issue. That thing at 34 milliseconds isn't the issue. So we've narrowed it down to two microservices here. So it's worth pointing out at this stage that the initial call into the system had to support a stateful HTTP request. So we're using an integration service there that basically takes that request, holds onto it, translates the message into JSON and puts the message on the queue and then all the individual microservices do pub sub. And then eventually when all the other things have finished doing what they're doing, a message goes back on the queue and the other thing that's sat there waiting responds back to the HTTP stateful request. So where we've got a slowdown, that integration service that's uh, sat there waiting for the outbound request is gonna take longer if something else is taking longer. So in this case, what we tend to do is kind of ignore that one to begin with and look at the others. So in this case, this microservice here that's calling Elasticsearch to do those searches is actually taking about 3.8 seconds. So we can dig into the, the spikes a bit more and we can see kind of all the, the, the graphs over time, basically. So, you have to trust me on this one. 
from that previous dashboard, I can get a unique ID for that journey, for that individual customer that was actually taking longer than it should. The reason I can't show you is there's some basically codes that might identify a customer. Um, but basically, from that, I can get a unique ID, because um, everything that comes into the system gets assigned a unique ID. So that takes me from my kind of 6 billion log lines down to 84. So it's the number of logs for that individual uh, consumer journey in this case. Okay. So from there, I can start to add more things in, like the, the log message, um, what particular microservice it corresponds to, and the time taken, et cetera, et cetera, the number of times that it might have needed to uh, retry. And if I order it by time taken, then I'm going to get the individual kind of log line that's causing me the, the issue here. So this is telling me that it's the Elasticsearch microservice that's causing the problem. And it's also telling me which class and which thread is actually causing the, the issue. So the developers now have a real kind of low level thing to go where in the code base. Um, we're actually wanting to take this a stage further because we can use APM um, from people like Dynatrace or Elastic to um, almost get to us, this is the line of code that's causing that, that spike in, in response time. Okay, so I'm just about done. So hopefully you can see that the kind of use of AWS there and its ability to scale, to analyze data has been a real critical part of building and running our software. And by ingesting and harnessing data in real time, we're able to get the best indicators of who consumers are and we can personalize and make the best decisions to deliver products in a simple and engaging way. Thanks very much for listening. Okay, thanks, Matt. We've got time for a, a couple of questions, if anybody's got a question before we welcome Serha. Anybody? One on the back there. So by um, the omission in terms of your chaos, where you're sort of testing, yeah. do you not do that in production at all? We don't. Unfortunately, we've not got to the Netflix uh, okay. ability of doing that yet. Um, so what we have done is expanded out the game days into other squads, mm -hmm. and they've been successful. Um, the reason we don't do it in production is really um, we would have to get a customer on board with that, and that would be um, an interesting conversation to have with them. Um, when we started out on this journey, uh, it's worth pointing out that... Um, the industry that we were focused on, not many people had gone to cloud, and we had to do a, a kind of hearts and minds piece in educating them, and now we don't have a single customer who's either not in the cloud, um, running some sort of workload in the cloud, or has gone kind of all in on a, one or more cloud providers, so that changes over time, and hopefully we can start to have those conversations with them to do more. Okay, great. Uh, I think we'll have to call it that because we've got uh, Sir yeah. coming up now. But thanks very much. If you just uh, give Matt another round of applause, please. Okay.